street, stand up 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 street, two shoulders down. So this basically says, I'm open to the world, but it also says, I can handle being open to the world. So it signifies confidence and confidence. The deepest Christian idea is that you should accept the vulnerability of being. That's the acceptance of the crucifixion. You don't have to ask for all the suffering that takes place. You are whine about that? No, and get resentful and bitter about it? Or are you going to say, bring it on? And handle it, no matter what it is. And the idea is that if you can do that, you will transcend the tragedy. And it's like, well, could that be true? Well, if you admire the courageous, so well, how courageous can you get? That's the question. How courageous can you get? Well, you practice. Stand up straight, stand up straight, stand up straight, with your shoulders back. Stand up straight, stand up straight, stand up straight, with your shoulders back. Stand up straight, stand up straight. Stand up straight, stand, stand up straight, stand up straight, stand up straight, stand up straight, put your shoulders down. You Hello, welcome everybody. Yay! It's the Jordan Peterson Book Club. Happy New Year. Uh, we've got Logic in the house, Lawrence, Shaman, Taylor, Survival, Different Gnome. How's everybody doing? Uh, that was a Cure the Dawn Logic. Um, he has musical versions of a lot of the Jordan Peterson and, and in fact, the whole intellectual dark web. Uh, folks, um, he takes um, <clears throat> his lo-fi music and mixes it with all of these intellectual talks, and he has an album on Jordan Peterson. So I thought I'd introduce our um, our book studies, uh, our our book club, with the uh, actual music because, to be honest, <laughs> I actually haven't read this book. This is the first time I'm cracking it. I've learned everything that I know um, about the 12 rules for life from um, music and talks that Jordan Peterson has done. So that's, that's how I thought I'd introduce this. And so uh, I wanted to show you his music because it's just absolutely fabulous in my, in, in my personal opinion. So <laughs> hello, Taylor. Yes. Hell, did, did people stay up? I actually went to bed at, uh, I think eight o'clock in the evening. So really super early. And then the second the fireworks started going off, my dog woke me up. Um, so, but he's doing a lot better. Let's see which way. Yeah. He's, he's back there. So, <laughs> but, um, yeah, new year, new year, new format. So we're going to be doing Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, Fridays is going to be a book club. We're starting with the 12 rules for life. Um, and by the time we're finished with that, we'll probably be on to the, the next book, um, the, the, his follow-up to the 12 Rules for Life, um, unless people want to do something different by that time. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Uh, and then on Saturday, same time, is going to be uh, biblical studies. And we're going to dive into uh, Jordan Peterson's biblical talks, but also uh, Paul Vanderclay. Uh, the Yale courses on the Old Testament and the New Testament, things like that. So um, should be really cool. Hey, Shaman, welcome. So, yeah, uh, hope hope everybody isn't too hungover. <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't do anything. I went to bed. <laughs> New Year's is one of those um, holidays that I don't actually like. Um, I've had a lot of fun at New Year's parties and stuff like that, but staying up like that, I mean, my holidays were just, uh, my health was, I mean, I needed the break. I needed the break um, and pretty much crashed and burned. 
uh, but now I'm clawing my way back to getting on uh, some sort of normal schedule. Of course, you know, I went to bed early and then what do I do? I wake up, stay awake for a few hours and, and take a nap and ruin the whole thing. <laughs> so we'll see if I get to bed early tonight. But um, is everybody ready? Chapter one. Chapter one. Oh, ah, the light, the light, the light. There we go. Jordan Peterson, 12 Rules for Life. So stayed up and did drink a lot, but not too much. Good, good, good. Good to hear, Taylor. Um, oh, wow. So chat wasn't working for everyone. Had to reset it. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, logic was up really late. Enjoy it while you can, while you're young. <laughs> it's one of those things. Um, so anyway, um, I would like uh, someone to, let me get the invite link. I'm going to be reading and I haven't turned into a gecko yet. So um, I uh, need someone to come up and kind of watch the chat and see if uh, anybody has any questions. Um, so I'm going to be in the book and then um, whoever <laughs> I'm sorry I missed that. <laughs> Deleted the after party live so fast. <laughs> Sounds like it was a good time. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so yeah, if anybody wants to, to come up, um, I know that I talked to Logic about this, but he has to leave early. We may just do a discussion at the end. So survival, no worries, no worries. Um, so Logic, yeah, if you want to come up or, or anybody, um, to watch the chat while I read, uh, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, I think I'll just pause every once in a while. But we are on chapter one. There is an overture that talks about the um, construction of the book, like how it came about, but I figured we could skip all that and just get right into the meat of it. So, um, but yeah, I'm going to... Wait, what do you want? Yeah, no, can't come up in my lap. I'm, I'm reading a book. Free freeze down on the floor. So, but anyway, let's start. Uh, rule number one, stand up straight with your shoulders back. Lobsters and territory. So if you're like most people, you don't often think about lobsters unless you're eating one. However, these interesting and delicious crustaceans are very much worth considering. Their nervous systems are complete, comparatively simple with large, easily observable neurons, the magic cells of the brain. Because of this, scientists have been able to map the neural circuitry of lobsters very accurately. This has helped us understand the structure and function of the brain and behavior of more complex animals, including human beings. Lobsters have more common with you than you might think, particularly when you are feeling crabby. Ha ha. And it actually says ha ha. Lobsters live on the ocean floor. They need a home base down there, ranging within. They hunt and prey and scavenge around for stray edible bits and pieces of whatever rains down from the continual chaos of carnage of death above. Um... They want somewhere secure where the hunting and the gathering is good. They want a home. Yeah. One page at a time, please. This can present a problem since there are many lobsters. What if two of them occupy the same territory at the bottom of the ocean at the same time and they both want to live there? What if they... There are hundreds of lobsters all trying to make and raise a family in the same crowded patch of sand and refuse. Uh, Rex is coming up. Hey, how's it going? Hey, Ben. Doing good. What's up? Yeah, uh, not much. New Year. I'm sorry. Yeah. I have a TV going in the background. Ah, it's all good. Oh, I have my phone going too. <laughs> cool. So, yeah, if you just want to keep an eye on the chat and. Um, yeah, uh, Taylor, I do think that crawfish fall into the same category. All, all those sort of, you know, um, and I've even got a lobster pendant that I wear in honor. Hey, you got your book right on. <laughs> I just I took the cover off it. 
but yeah, oh, I love this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're further along than me, so. All right, hold on. I need to put Free Free up on the bed because she is being very nice. No, there's no treat. Go up in the bed. Up in the bed. <laughs> Hope everybody had a happy New Year's. Yeah. A little. Oh, my God. I drank way too much. Oh. <laughs> I thought like I would know better by now. Oh no, no. Well, see, that's the thing is that when uh, uh, Akira the Don actually has a song that Jordan Peterson did on drinking, um, oh, yeah. which, which is hilarious. Uh, and what drinking does is it lights up the brain and it makes everything seem like a good idea. Right. Yeah. <laughs> another beer and another beer and another beer and then right, uh, right. So. Oh yeah, that would be great. You know, just elevate this feeling a little bit more, and I, you know, no consequences. <laughs> so bad <laughs> since last year. Yeah, yeah. It was gonna start getting those folks. I haven't seen you guys all year. Right, it's not like we don't do that joke every year. Um, yeah, I did like an after party live where I. Don't rem I remember I did a live. I don't remember what I said or what I did. I was playing music and I watched like five seconds of it and I deleted it. it wow. It. Wow. That yeah, was a little foolish, I think. Uh, so, yeah, Taylor says I could, you know, just to that. Um, and then, yeah, the the covers. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where I usually take the covers off, but since you know this is a, I'm gonna be right back. This dog is bugging the hell out of me. Come on, freak me. Come on. No problem. I'll take over. What's going on, guys? Yeah, the um, yeah, the cover. I actually took the cover off because it was so annoying. I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate it either. And then, I uh, no, my book kind of got beat up, but I guess it's supposed to. Um, by the time I got to chapter eight, too, I was highlighting a lot of stuff. I've been highlighting, but that's chapter eight. Let's not do chapter eight. You have a joke? <laughs> what do you call an insect that came from the moon? A lunatic. Oh, my God. <laughs> I stayed just in time to get that. So. Yeah, Lauren's had a <laughs> Lawrence with the puns. I love it. I know. <laughs> the antibody one, the gummy bear. I love the gummy bear. That was probably my favorite one, uh, favorite joke so far. Yeah, yeah. The lunatic was good, though. So which chapter did you say was your favorite? Oh, right now, um, I actually can't even make up my mind. It's like I've been stuck on chapter eight because it's like, I don't know, I kind of haven't had the right head space and I just can't get my head in the book anymore for some reason. It's like, I yep. get so sidetracked. I start reading, you know, a paragraph and my mind just drifts for some reason. And I go to my phone or I'll turn on Netflix and, you know, which is, that's why I like that you're, you're doing this book club. So yeah. maybe I can get back into it a little bit. Right. I'm stuck on rule eight, tell the truth or at least don't lie. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a really yeah. tough one. Because um, I, I actually, huh? I started highlighting passages that I like. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, when I first got sober, I spent about a year. And thank God I was with other people in sobriety because I could immediately say, oh, nope, that was a lie. Let me correct that. And they understood that I was rewiring my brain for the truth and they wouldn't be offended or, you know, immediately, you know, write me off as somebody who was dishonest. They, they realized that it was a work in progress. So, yeah. Yeah, no goals, for sure. It's like yeah. you have to get used to being uncomfortable with it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it feels weird. It, it really does. And as I say, it took me about a year to really get it down pat. And now, you know, even a little white lie for politeness sake bothers me. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I used to do that a lot, too. And now it's like I totally almost have no filter, I think, at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I do is I think of constructive ways to say things, you know. Right. 
and um, ways that I can tell the truth, but it's not so brutal, if that makes sense. Sorry, I was yawning. No, it's all right. You were up until four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. So bad. All right. Oh, hey, Dakota Shay. Good to see you. So, yeah. All right. Let's jump back in. Um, so, what if there are hundreds of lobsters all trying to make a living, raise a family in the same crowded patch of sand and refuse? Other creatures have this problem too. When songbirds come north in the spring, for example, they engage in ferocious territorial disputes. The songs they sing, so peaceful and beautiful to human ears, are a siren cry of domination. The, a brilliantly musical bird is a small warrior proclaiming his sovereignty. Take the wren, for example, a small feisty insect eating songbird common in North America. A newly arrived wren wants a sheltered place to build a nest away from the wind and rain. He also wants it close to food and attract potential mates. He also wants to convince competitors for that. He wants to, yeah, he also wants to convince competitors for that space to keep their distance. Okay. Uh, birds and territory. My dad and I delighted in a house for a wren family when I was 10 years old. It looked like a Constantinople wagon. It had a front entrance about the size of a quarter. This made for a good house for wrens who are tiny and not so good for other larger birds who couldn't get in. My elderly neighbor had a birdhouse too, which we built for her at the same time from an old rubber boot. It had an opening large enough for a bird the size of a robin. She was looking forward to the day it was occupied. A wren soon discovered our birdhouse and made himself at home there. We could hear his lengthy, trilling song repeated over and over again during the early spring. Once he'd built his nest in the covered wagon, however, our new avian tenants started carrying small sticks to our neighbor's nearby boot. He packed it so full that no other bird, large or small, could possibly get in. Our neighbor was not pleased by this preemptive strike, but there was nothing to be done about it. If we take it down said my dad, and clean it up and put it back in the tree, the wren will just put a packet full of sticks again. Wrens are small, and they're cute, but they're merciless. I had broken my leg skiing the previous winter, first time down the hill, and received some money from a school insurance policy designed to reward unfortunate, clumsy children. I purchased a cassette recorder, a high-tech novelty at the time, with the proceeds. <clears throat> my dad suggested I sit on the back lawn, record the run song, and play it back and watch what happened. So I went out into the bright spring sunlight and taped a few minutes of the wren laying furious claim to the territory with song. Then I let him hear his own voice. That little bird, one-third the size of a sparrow, began to dive bomb me and my cassette recorder, swooping back and forth inches from the speaker. We saw a lot of that sort of behavior, even in the absence of the tape recorder. If a larger bird ever dare sit and rest on any of the trees near our birdhouse, there was a good chance he would get knocked off his perch by a kamikaze wren. Now, wrens and lobsters are very different. Lobsters do not fly, sing, or perch in trees. Wrens have feathers, not hard shells. Wrens can't breathe underwater and are seldom served with butter. However, they're also similar in important ways. Both are obsessed with status and position, for example, like a great many creatures. The Norwegian zoologist and comparative psychologist Thorleif, oh boy, I'm going to screw this name up, Sheldrop Ebb observed back in 1921 that even a common barnyard chicken establishes a pecking order. The determination of who's who in the chicken world has important implications for each individual bird's survival, particularly in times of scarcity. The birds that have priority access on whatever food is sprinkled out in the yard in the morning are the, cel are the celebrity chickens. After them comes the second stringers, the hangers-on, the wannabes. Then third-rate chickens have their own and so on down to the bedraggled, partially feathered, badly packed wretches who occupy the lowest untouchable stratum in the chicken hierarchy. 
Chickens, like suburbanites, live communally. Songbirds, such as wrens, do not, but they still inhabit a dominance hierarchy. It's just spread out over more territory. The wiliest, strongest, and healthiest, and most fortunate birds occupy prime territory and defend it. Because of this, they are more likely to attract highly quality mates and hatch chicks who survive and thrive. Protection from wind, rain, and predators, as well as easy access to superior food, makes them for much less stressed existence. Territory matters, and there is little difference between the territory rights and social status. It is often a matter of life and death. If a contagious avian disease sweeps through the neighborhood of a well-stratified songbird, it is the least dominant and the most stressed birds occupying the lowest rungs of the bird world who are most likely to sicken and die. This is equally true of human neighborhoods when bird flu viruses and other illnesses sweep across the planet. The poor and the stressed always die first and in greater numbers. They are also much more susceptible to non-infectious diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. When the aristocracy catches a cold, as it is said, it is the working class that dies of pneumonia. Because of territory matters and because of the best locales are always in short supply, territory seeking among animals produces conflict. Conflict in turn produces another problem, how to win or lose without the disagreeing parties incurring too great a cost. This latter point is particularly important. Imagine that two birds engage in a squabble about a desirable nesting area. The interaction can easily degenerate into an outright physical combat. Under such circumstances, one bird, usually the larger, will eventually win. But even the victor may be hurt in the fight. That means a third bird, an undamaged canny bystander, can move in opportunistically and defeat the now crippled victor. That is not a good idea for the first two birds. I'm going to take a break there. Yeah, that's, um, I love the way he explains it, especially when he goes into the dominance hierarchy. Yeah. And how everything is arranged. He, he lays it out really well. Yeah. In my opinion. It's, um, yeah, yeah go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just, um, everybody's saying hi and happy new years and stuff like that. So welcome, Joanne. Glad you're here. So... But yeah, I mean, I, I see this all the time and um, especially working among um, the homeless and like soup kitchens and stuff like that. They are always sick. Always, 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 always. Um, and, you know, so I had to keep my volunteering so that I wouldn't actually interact with any of our patrons um, cause they would always be carrying something. I mean, like, uh, my friend who actually would clean up afterwards got the worst case of MRSA from somebody, um, just by cleaning the toilets. Oh, you know? Yeah. So this yeah. guy, yeah. I mean, it, it got into his lungs and then like exploded out his elbow and, you know, it was, I mean, it, it was horrible. It was horrible. So oh, yeah, yeah, it's. Always the people on the lowest rungs who are the sickest. And if you get yeah, sick, you I fall to a little bit. Huh? I actually came, um, had a, a case of MRSA as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So MRSA nearly killed me. Huh? I didn't even know until they tested it. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. See, mine was so obvious that it was just, and I, and I caught it after a surgery, you know, which, oh, wow. which yeah, pissed me the hell off. Um, yeah, definitely. That's yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I, I had the surgery and I, I had woken up during the surgery because my face was burning. Well, that was the MRSA. I could actually feel it in my skin. And like the next couple of days, I was out in the car listening to some music and I looked in the rearview mirror and the bottom of my chin was wet. I was like, what the hell is going on? And I patted it and the whole bottom just came off. And that's called sloughed skin syndrome. And MRSA is one of the things that causes that. So I have these little, well, other side, little white dots on my face, this one here, this here on my nose, and then scars on my chin. And those are all from MRSA. Yeah, I have a little bit of that, like, on my arm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not so, fun. And, and it's so endemic in Seattle that, you know, I couldn't sue the uh, surgeon 
for not having a clean operating theater. Damn. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of SOL on that. But. Yeah, I'd say sometimes you make you sign a waiver, too. Yeah. Uh, releasing them from any liability. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It, it, mine was part of a scientific study, so I don't know if that was part of the waiver. It may have been. It may have been. Um, oh, man. I feel like I should have had a cup of coffee or something. You want to go grab one? I'll read a little bit more. You can listen. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be I'll be here on the mic. Right on. Let me keep my mic on. So I love wireless. Yeah, yeah, wireless is nice. Uh, no. <laughs> okay. oh. <sighs> yeah, no, my my little dachshund almost tipped the whole laundry basket over, and I had to catch her. <laughs> oh, Get feisty. Yeah, yeah. All right. There we go. Conflict and territory. Over the millennia, animals who must cohabitate with others in the same territory have, in consequence, learned many tricks to establish dominance while risking the least amount of possible damage. Oh, I, before we get into this, um, dung beetles. Uh, there's a, a study about dung beetles that they did down in Africa. Um, where they noticed that there are two types of dung beetles. There is the dung beetle that makes the dung ball, and then there is the dung beetle that steals the dung ball. So really? it's all, yeah, it's all a matter of how you use your energy. That sounds funny as heck. Uh-huh. So imagine it. You know, you're working hard. You're exhausted after a long time of work. You've got this giant dung ball. That is your payday. And then, you know, some asshole holds you up and you get into a fight, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, and it's, it's a, it's a balanced survival of the fittest because, you know, what's more useful, a slow, steady expenditure of, you know, energy or quick, ferocious battle. Mm. And so, yeah. And it's and it's just a question because sometimes you know if you're if you're higher up on the hierarchy of the dung beetle, you can you know make a dung ball and fight them off. But if also if you're a lazy dung beetle, you know you can just save up all your energy, find the guy with the biggest dung ball and just knock him off his perch, if you're lucky enough. Yeah, I I see it. It's like I can see it in my head how it's like uh, the dominance hierarchy works out. Mm -hmm. you have on both sides of the equation. Right, right. And what's funny is that the survival rate is such that each new generation of dung beetles, you still end up with a 50-50 split of, you know, one half makes the dung balls and the other half steals the dung balls. So <laughs> I think it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. How it's like because it calls out to nature, and it's like I feel like to a certain extent, like humans, we we kind of forget that we're also part of nature. Yeah. Because like, we've removed ourselves from nature so much. Yep. That we forget that we're animals, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like all of our sci-fi and everything like that is about, you know, transhumanism. And having you know the cyborg bodies and just our brains and you know that that won't ever work. I mean, I if, so. if you if you talk to any because your your brain isn't just in your head, it's also your gut, it's also your heart, it's also all through your skin, and we don't understand skin scientifically yet, at all. Really? Yeah. It's, it's one of the most fascinating things because the skin has its own nervous system that's different than actual nerves. And we huh. don't quite understand how it works yet. But it's and, like, yeah, it's like when like the, the hairs in your skin stand up or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Study. I, I remember reading an article like or why, you know, the hair stands up on your skin or it's like a kind of... I don't want to say spidey sense because it sounds stupid. 
No, it absolutely is true. Um, and they actually found that during World War II um, when they were working with Native Americans, because the longer your hair is, the more of a spidey sense you have. And when they, when they gave all these uh, Native American soldiers a buzz cut to fit in with the Navy, they lost that sixth sense. Ah. Yeah. And it's, it's a very intuitive sort of feeling the air thing. I'm about to grow out my hair. Right? <laughs> <laughs> if I have any left, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, all right, here we are. A defeated wolf, for example, will roll over in its back, exposing its throat to the victor, who will not then dare to tear it out. The now dominant wolf may still require a further hunting party. After all, even one as pathetic as his now defeated foe. Bearded dragons, remarkably social lizards, wave their front legs peaceably at one another to indicate their wish for continued social harmony. Dolphins produce specialized sound pulses while hunting and during other times of high excitement to reduce potential conflict among dominant and subordinate group members. Such behavior is endemic to the community of living things. Lobsters scuttling around on the ocean floor are no exception. If you catch a few dozen and transport them to a new location, you can observe their status forming rituals and techniques. Each lobster will first begin to explore the new territory partly to map its details and partly to find a good place for shelter. Lobsters learn a lot about where they live and they remember them when they return or when they learn. If you startle one near its nest, it will quickly zip back to hide there. If you startle it some distance away, however, it will immediately dart towards the nearest suitable shelter previously identified and now remembered. A lobster needs a safe place, a safe hiding place to rest, free from pre predators and the forces of nature. Furthermore, as lobsters grow, they molt or shed their skin, shells, which leaves them soft and vulnerable for extended periods of time. A burrow underneath a rock makes a good lobster home, particularly if it is located where the shells and other detritus can be dragged into place to cover the entrance once the lobster is snugly ensconced inside. However, there may be only a small number of high quality shelters or hiding places in each new territory. They are scarce and valuable. Other lobsters will continually seek them out. This means that lobsters often encounter one another when out exploring. Researchers have demonstrated that even a lobster raised in isolation knows what to do when such a thing happens. It's complex defensive and aggressive behaviors built right into its nervous system. It begins to dance around like a boxer, opening and raising its claws, moving backwards, forwards, side to side, mirroring its opponent, waving its open claws back and forth. At the same time, it deploys special jets under its eyes to direct streams of liquid at its opponent. This liquid contains a mix of chemicals that tell the other lobster about its size, sex, health, and mood. Isn't that interesting? Wow. Right? What? Yeah. Liquid from the eyes. Yeah. So, so is that, well, is that kind of, um, I don't know, like pheromone? Yes. Very much so. Okay. Yes, I'm following that. Yeah. I completely forgot that part. Yeah, I'm glad I'm starting it over, basically. Nice. Taylor says, um, it's so weird because I never think of animals other than dogs and cats to have mental thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, right. you get down to some of the most simple creatures out there. And um, who was it? I think it was Robert Feinstein. Um, uh, he's a, the physicist that figured out how the O-rings failed on the space shuttle. Um, and his books are, are hilarious. They're a great read. And uh, he, he was studying uh, amoeba, which are single-celled organisms. And they usually have this particular shape. But if you stress them out bad enough, they will break their own rules and break their shape. Like as, as a slide dries out, and they will, they will seek out water by breaking their own body shape um, at, at, to be able to sense further 
and get them out, themselves out of a stressful situation. So even down to single celled organisms, this stuff huh. applies. It's it's absolutely fascinating. That's like the building so, blocks, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all the way up. You know, it's it's turtles all the way up. <laughs> so sometimes one lobster can immediately tell from the display of claw size that it is much smaller than its opponent and will back down without a fight. The chemical information exchanged in the spray can have the same effect, convincing a less healthy or less aggressive lobster to retreat. That's dispute resolution. That's dispute level resolution level one. If the two lobsters are very close in size and apparent ability, however, or if the exchange of liquids has been insufficiently informative, they will proceed to dispute resolution level two. With antennae whipping madly and claws folded downward, one will advance and the other retreat. Then the defender will advance and the aggressor retreat. After a couple of rounds of this behavior, the more nervous of the lobsters may feel that continuing is not in its best interest. <laughs> he will flick his tail reflexively, dart backwards and vanish, try to and try his luck elsewhere. If neither blinks, however, the lobsters move to level three, which involves genuine combat. I mean, that's just like what countries do. I've always wondered how like lobsters fight each other. Like, what do they just grip each other or they claw at each other? Um, they they try and grip each other. One claw is made for crushing. The other claw is made yeah. for cutting. Right. Um, and they'll try and flip each other over and, and all sorts of, it gets messy. It gets really messy. I kind of want to like drive into like a YouTube rabbit hole of like lobster fights now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, it was funny. I, I had a thought that I almost forgot when you mentioned the dogs. And yeah, I'm wondering, you know how we have like self thought that like, we think in our head, oh, what am I going to do today or go to this? Like, do dogs? do that have their own kind of language in their head like you know why is my owner such a dipshit they, <laughs> do they think to themselves at all <laughs> in their own language um i think so uh, i think we all do i i think that um but it it may be uh less, like whoops well not even whoops but more oh. um, intuitive feelings like i'm hungry you know, I'm oh, yeah, I got you. So it's not an exactly like a language thought, like we have in our own head, like a language thought. Right, you know? right. It's more of an urge thought. Yeah. Okay, I'm following. Yeah, because I was like, do they start like woofing inside their own head? Well, they do woof in dreams, so <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I've seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Funny. My dog Sam has the most incredibly active dreams, um, you know, and I can even tell the difference in his whoops if he's dreaming of chasing squirrels um, <laughs> or he's in a fight and he's trying to, you know, so I can I can tell him, you know, good dog or you're safe or you know, I can tell the nature of his dreams by his by his barks. Oh, so, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Samantha P has a comment. Uh, Marxist, their hierarchies are only secondary consequence of capitalism. What you see? Yeah, no, yeah, she's she's commenting that Marxists don't believe that the hierarchy exists, and it's like, uh, yeah. you know, try that one again. <laughs> exactly, it's like right in your face. It's like I don't know how they could deny that. Yeah, well. It, uh, Brainwashing works. Yeah, I, I sometimes say it looks like MK Ultra worked on a couple people. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> so uh, different gnome says uh, Lindy Beige has nice videos on escalation. He looks at the faults of Dungeons and Dragons with the use of weapons to settle group disputes rather than with fists. Huh, that's interesting. Yeah, um, a lot of gamers oversimplify the world, and that's why I think that it's a really, really awful thing that we're raising a generation of kids on video games because that's not how the world works. The world is much more complex, much more nuanced. Yeah. So there's not enough balance. Yeah, 
Like I admit, even myself, I used to spend, I don't know, six, eight hours I could have spent, you know, just mm-hmm. playing a board game. And I just realized, like, geez. It messes your brain up. I mean, we get wired for that dopamine hit. And if we don't get that as often as you do in a video game, you become discouraged, despondent, all those other things. Doing work in the real life, in the real world, takes much longer for a payout. It takes much more determination. Um, you know, it's 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 harder, but with a better reward. But games wire you for that quick reward. You know, the harder the game is, the less likely people are playing it because they don't get that dopamine hit. And we figured right. this out back in the eighties. Yeah, that's that's another balance right there. Yeah, how mm-hmm. hard the game is. Yeah, you have the hardcore gamers that that makes them play even more. They right, more of a challenge. They get more. It's more reward <laughs> at the end of it. That exactly, exactly. Um, but too many people just like Candy Crush. You oh know? God, I never downloaded that freaking game. Uh, but it's it's the most downloaded game ever. Yeah, I can see why. Exactly. I seen a, I seen a friend playing it. It was just nonstop. I'm like, dude, I could never play games on my phone like that. Like most of the right. word game. Yeah. But yeah, that I mean that that game is designed for that quick dopamine hit, and people just stay in it like they're in a drug trance. It's it's really ugh, kind of scary. What was that other one? Oh, Angry Birds. Was it Angry Birds? Flappy Bird? Angry Bird? Either Flappy one of those. Bird. Yeah. yeah, it was Flappy Bird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually did play that game a few times. It pissed me off so much. Right. So Samantha P says that's where Jordan Peterson got the ideas to study lobsters, crustaceans, to prove even the simplest and oldest forms of life have hierarchies. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. I mean, bugs have hierarchies. You know. Um, well, yeah, the dung beetle. You said. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, ants. Ants definitely have them. Yeah. Um, Yep, bees, same thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we got the queen. Yep. Oh, my uh, aunt keeps bees, and bees will get oh. bored. Really? Yeah, and you know what they do when they get bored? No. Line dancing. Oh, shoot. Why, why do I remember that? I think I've seen that in a meme. Yeah. Yeah, so bees, they'll get up together on the outside of the hive, and they'll do line dances when they're bored. <laughs> throwing a party right <laughs> you know, i want to go into a youtube rabbit hole about line dance bees right <laughs> so all right where was i okay yeah this time the now enraged this is the level three fighting this is the lobster fight uh the now enraged lobsters come at each other visit come at each other each other viciously with their claws extended to grapple. Each time tries to flip the other on its back. The successfully flipped lobster will conclude that its opponent is capable of inflicting serious damage. It generally gives up and leaves, although it harbors intense resentment and gossips endless, endlessly about the victor behind its back. I don't know if that part is true. <laughs> If neither can overturn the other, or if one will not quite not, one will not quit despite being flipped, the lobsters now move to level four. Doing so involves extreme risk and is not all, not something to be engaged in without forethought. One or both lobsters will emerge damaged from the ensuing fray, perhaps fatally. The animals advance on each other with increasing speed. Their claws are open so that they can grab a leg or an antenna or an eye stalk or anything else exposed and vulnerable. Once a body part has been successfully grabbed, the grabber will tail flick backwards sharply with claw clamped firmly shut and try and tear it off. Disputes that have escalated to this point typically create a clear winner and loser. The loser is unlikely to survive, particularly if he or she remains in the territory occupied by the winter, winner, now a mortal enemy. In the aftermath of a losing battle, regardless of how aggressively the lobster has behaved, 
It becomes unwilling to fight further, even against another previously defeated opponent. A vanquished competitor loses confidence, sometimes for days. Sometimes the defeat can have even more severe consequences. If a dominant lobster is badly defeated, its brain basically dissolves. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's creepy. Then it grows a new subordinate's brain, one more appropriate to its new lowly position. Its original brain just isn't sophisticated to manage the transformation from king to bottom dog without virtually complete disillusion and regrowth. Anyone who has experienced a painful transformation after a serious defeat in romance or career may feel some kind of kinship with the once successful frustration. Now, I can relate to that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I mean, going going from really healthy, you know, able to work 80 hours a day, you know, no problem, have plenty of playtime on the weekend, everything like that, to disabled, you know, I had to rewire my entire brain because nothing that I knew before worked. So, different okay. Dome says... Uh-oh, smelly chemicals, failed use, escalation, level three, flip them over. <laughs> That's great. It's like a forklift. I don't know why I keep getting the image of like a forklift. No, it makes no sense at all. Yeah, yeah, not so much. Well, that's kind of how their tail works. It's, it's like a forklift. They, they scoop backwards by um, flipping stuff. Oh, right. Okay. All right. Yeah. That, I guess that makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just my brain. It's probably just because of the, the alcohol is still leaving. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Saturated. Yeah. Add some ibuprofen to that. Uh, Harvard figured out a cup of coffee, a glass of water, and two ibuprofen. If you take that the night before you go to bed, mm -hmm. that reduces the hangover. Oh man, I hope something because I haven't really, I haven't taken anything for it, like any kind of medication or Tylenol wise or. Yeah, they say ibuprofen, not Tylenol and not aspirin. Oh, so Tylenol doesn't work? Not very well, no. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Boo. I'll just <laughs> take some. I guess that's pointless. Right, yeah. Find the ibuprofen. I don't even think I have any of that. Oh, wow. Uh, Taylor oh, wow. says, uh, could be like getting out of the military with a certain life, getting out and being among civilians and then learning a new life. Yep. Yep. Um, Samantha P says, one of the most interesting animals in male mating techniques is the cuttlefish. Yes. I don't know if it's all cuttlefish, but definitely the giant Australian cuttlefish. I want... I want a tiny one that look at you so intensely. Yeah, um, we we had cuttlefish when I was a kid, and they're beautiful. Um, but yeah, they're fierce fighters. But they'll, I mean, they'll they'll come, they'll attack your finger and stuff like that. I mean, they're really territorial. It's amazing. So, um, the neurochemistry of defeat and victory. A lobster's loser brain chemistry differs importantly from that of a lobster winner. This is reflected in their relative postures. When a lobster is confident or cringing depends on the ratio of two chemicals that modulate communication between the lobster's neurons, serotonin and octopamine. With increase of the ratio of the former to the latter, uh, winning increases the ratio of the former to the latter, so more serotonin and less octopamine. The lobster with high levels of serotonin and low levels of octopamine is a cocky, strutting sort of shellfish, much less likely to back down when challenged. This is because serotonin helps regulate postural flexion. A flexed lobster extends its appendages so that it can look tall and dangerous like Clint Eastwood in a spaghetti western. When a lobster has just lost a battle, is exposed to serotonin, it will stretch itself out, advance on even former victors, and fight longer and harder. The drugs dis prescribed to depressed human beings, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, 
have much the same chemical and behavioral effect. In one of the more staggering demonstrations of evolutionary continuity of life on Earth, Prozac even cheers up lobsters. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So Samantha says one cup of water per drink helps. It's mostly dehydration that causes the hangover. Yep. Um, and then the dehydration causes inflammation. So. What was it? Like? The sneaky beta male that dresses yeah. women to get the girl? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. they can outwit the bitter, bigger, better fighting males. Yeah, there's there's all sorts of, of different mating techniques that humans use, that animals use, stuff like that. Interesting. Thanks for the tip, Pam. <laughs> so, so jealous, Pam. Jealous of, not sure of what, but yeah, no, um, I know that like migraine is a serotonin, um, what do you call it? Maladaptation where in, during a migraine, your body actually flushes your entire supply of serotonin in your head and in your bloodstream and you just urinate it out. So like SSRIs and stuff like that don't work on me because it's like trying to put a lid on a bucket with a hole in it, you know? <laughs> that was a good analogy. Right, right. And it, Or a metaphor. It's an analogy, it, metaphor analogy both work. But okay. um, yeah, it's frustrating because the, they know Oh, that jealous that I had cuttlefish. Got it. Got it. Well, you can get them in Walgreens. I mean, you know, they're pretty much everywhere. So, but um, the, uh, yeah, we know enough about the brain to know that that's what's going on, but we have no idea how to fix it because there's no yeah. like, short term. I mean, you know, we have Imitrax and stuff like that, which is a serotonin-like molecule because serotonin, that they've done experiments where they've actually injected it into the bloodstream, but it's so irritating that um, you don't want to use it as a medication just straight the way it is. So they took the molecule and they, they kind of jiggered it a little bit, changed the shape of it so that the side effects are less severe. Um, because the way it works in the bloodstream is it actually makes all your blood vessels tighten oh. up. Okay. So Imitrex, Relpax, any of those drugs are all serotonin-like molecules. And I can't take any of them because the side yeah. effects are so severe. I mean, it, it feels like your, your heart is closing up. You can't breathe very well because all the blood vessels are just tightening up. And it's, it feels like something's sitting on your chest. It's just, ugh. It's not fun. Is that the way that uh, would Percocets work the same way? Like painkillers work the same way? No, those work on opioid receptors. Oh, okay. So it's different receptors to figure yeah. out. Yeah. I couldn't tolerate Percocet for that much. I mean, when I was taking them, it was uh, very hit or miss. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like sometimes I would feel okay on them, and then other times I would just go from a hot flash and sweating all over the place yeah it was um yeah. I, next surgery i'm definitely gonna recommend the doctor uh, use a different painkiller yeah yeah and yeah i mean that's that's why we have so many different painkillers is that the way you know our bodies are not one size fit all right. you know we have the same building blocks but they're constructed in different ways and so we'll have different reactions like that like um, there's some opiates that absolutely do not work on me at all. Like fentanyl, I used to have the fentanyl lollipops, which they usually only give to like cancer pain patients. Yeah. And I chewed up an entire lollipop. Nothing. Doesn't help the pain. No side effects. Nothing. It just doesn't work on me. And it has to do with the type of, yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> so it has to do with the type of enzymes that my body produces and it, oh, right. right. 
that eats yeah. it up. Or or doesn't allow the reaction or something. Yeah, that stuff is no joke. The last time I had it ended up in the ER, they ended up using morphine on me and uh and fentanyl. Like I saw the label, it said it fentanyl in it. I hated the way it made me feel. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, you know, just let me, I guess, just go to the pain at that point. That right. Well, the really interesting worse. Yeah. The interesting thing about morphine is that um, studies show that it doesn't actually decrease the amount of pain. It just makes you not care about the pain. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's still there. It's just. Um... Yeah. It just, it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't think they release serotonin. Um, let me look that up real quick. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm going to lay down real quick. Okay, you do that. <laughs> sorry. I'm getting, like, dizzy in the in the chair. Oh, no. Yeah, it'll, it'll, I'll be better tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. It'll remind me of why I don't really like drinking. I don't, I don't really, I'm not a big drinker, actually. But, I mean, I guess I was last night. Well, but yeah, you, 10 years you can go overboard easily. Yeah, for sure. I mean, especially with the beers. Those are pretty good beers. It was like Stella, uh, Dark Lager Stella, which I never even knew they had. So I didn't know what to expect. Yeah. yeah that's why I always stick with bourbon. I'm, I don't drink any, I don't drink wine. I don't drink, you know, anything else. It's it's bourbon or nothing, you know, because I, I know how bourbon affects me. I know right. how much I can drink. I know how to space it out. You know, anything yeah. else, it would be a crapshoot. Yeah, that's where I screwed up yesterday. And uh, like my father bought the beers. Um, he's more of a beer drinker. So we bought a 12 pack and uh, I bought some Maker's Mark for me, you know, the whiskey bourbon. Uh huh. So, yeah, I made the mistake of mixing that at some point. So, Ooh, yeah, that was also not a good idea. Right. <laughs> Different Gnome says, I drink about one shot of whiskey every quarter. So, yeah, it, it's I space mine out usually an hour every two hours, but I take a stronger single shot. Mm -hmm. So I'll take like it's a quarter to a third of a cup. I don't know how many shots that is. But uh, I do that, and then yeah, you know, hour two hours later, I'll take another one. But yeah, see, that's being smart with it. Yeah, why didn't I do that? <laughs> at one point, I was just like popping the beers open as soon as I finished one. I was on to the next. Oh no, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was in party mode last night. So. Yeah, you were. Yeah, you were. Well, live and learn. <laughs> All right. I, I would have learned at some point. <laughs> oh, man. Sometimes it takes, I mean, even they say, what is it? Um, on the DEA website, they said that it takes about seven, real, an average, average, now mind you, of seven relapses to establish sobriety. And that's, wow. and it's, it's true of sobriety, but it's also true they found of diabetic medication of heart medication, of anything. It takes about seven mistakes, big mistakes, for us to pick up a new habit. Damn. Right? Uh, yeah, we thought we would learn so much better than that, but we're, we're I guess we're a stubborn species. Yeah, very, very, or, or hopeful. <laughs> you know, you could say it either way. <laughs> It's so weird. That's why I like watching uh, the media whenever I hear like these, uh, you know, kind of reporters talk about we live in a civil society or, you know, how could this happen in a civil society? I'm like, what about our civilization or our society is really that civil? Right. Yeah. No, we are a thin veneer of, civil of civilization over 70,000 years of caveman. Yeah, it's like we're right on the cliff of mm -hmm. you know, one little push, and we could just totally devolve into back into, I don't know, where we used to be. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to get uh, this question here from Samantha, and it looks like there are a few papers talking about drug interaction. I don't know if it's 
Um, if it's actual brain chemistry, but um, it does say that recent studies have found that acute morphine administration does increase serotonin transmission, but that doesn't say that it actually increases supply of serotonin. So um, I don't know that it releases serotonin, but it may increase the activation of serotonin. So, you know, you're, you're onto something there, Samantha. Um, different gnome said, oh, yeah, once every quarter. He meant once every three months. One shot of whiskey once every three months. Wow. Uh, he says, I usually have to work or drive. And when I can drink, I forget that I have alcohol, right? <laughs> That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. So I'm worried that I might just need to keep it out of the house because, but my pain has been, I'm on a new pain prescription and we still haven't gotten the balance right. And the weather has been just absolutely atrocious. So there was a couple of days in there um, where I was taking a lot of opiates, uh, more than, than I should have. And I, I let my doctor know, so she knows that I had some really bad days, but it was because my Botox got screwed up because I had COVID. Usually I get Botox every three months, but I had COVID. And so I didn't have Botox for a number of weeks. So the pain just went through the roof. Like, oh. you know, yeah, something I haven't experienced in years um perhaps decades even and uh yeah so i i, I had a, it was a, after lawrence's birthday it was a rough time <laughs> yeah i kind of noticed i didn't uh, see you around as much and i was wondering i was like damn i hope she's okay yeah yeah no i was i was i was going through a gauntlet as it were yeah, oh, was, yeah sounds bad yeah the word gauntlet to describe it that's yeah that's definitely bad yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, w I wasn't going on YouTube for other people's lives. I mean, I just was, I, I had to manage my pain and that's the best I could do. My house is a wreck. <laughs> yeah. So, I noticed that because you were completely gone. Yep. Yep. So yeah, if I fall out like that, it's usually because I'm not feeling well. So, all right. Where were we? Yeah. Uh, I uh, what? Let's see. Okay. The new chemistry. The uh, Prozac even cheers up lobsters. That's where we are. Page seven at the bottom. So yeah. high serotonin, low octopamine characterizes the victor. The opposite neurochemistry, uh, neurochemical configuration, high ratio of octopamine and serotonin produces a defeated, scrunched up, inhibited, drooping, sulking sort of lobster very likely to hang around the street corners and to vanish at the first hint of trouble. Serotonin and octopamine also regulate the tail, flicks, tail flick reflex, which serves to propel a lobster rapidly backwards when it needs to escape. Less provocation is necessary to trigger that reflex in a defeated lobster. You can see an echo of that in the heightened startled reflex characteristic of the soldier or battered child with post-traumatic stress disorder. So the principles of unequal distribution. When a defeated lobster regains its courage and dares to fight again, and is more likely to lose again than you would predict, statistically, from a tally of its previous fights. Its victorious opponent, on the other hand, is more likely to win. It's a winner take all in the lobster world, just as it is in human societies, where the top 1% have as much loot as the bottom 50% and where the richest 85 people have as much as the bottom three and a half billion. Ooh. Wow. <laughs> so Samantha P says to you, um, on civility, access to clean water, plumbing, electricity, we are doing okay. Pam, thanks for checking into it. No problem. So. Yeah, <laughs> uh, so let's see. That same brutal principle of unequal distribution applies outside the financial domain. Indeed, anywhere that creative production is required. The majority of scientific papers are published by a very small group of scientists. 
A tiny proportion of musicians produces almost all the recorded commercial music. Just a handful of all authors sell all the books. A million and a half separately titled books sell each year in the U.S. However, only 500 of these sell more than 100,000 copies. Similarly, four classical composers, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, and Tchaikovsky, wrote almost all the music played by modern orchestras. Bach, for his part, composed so prolifically that it would take decades of work merely to hand copy his scores, yet only a small fraction of this prodigious output is commonly performed. The same thing applies to the output of the other three members of this group of hyper-dominant composers. Only a small fraction of their work is still widely played. It's kind of like one-hit wonders, you know? But if you produce a whole ton of albums, you have an entire album, you know, like a best hits. So. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, that's a small fraction of the music composed by a small fraction of all the classical composers who have ever composed makes up almost all the classical music that the world knows and loves. This principle, sometimes known as Price's Law, after Derek J. DeSalata Price, the researcher who discovered its application in science in 1963. It can be modeled use, using an approximately L-shaped graph with the number of people on the vertical axis and productivity of resources on the horizontal. The basic principle had been discovered much earlier. Vilfredo Petrio, uh, 1848 to 1923, an Italian polymath noticed its application to wealth distribution in the earliest 20th century, and it appears true for every society ever studied, regardless of governmental form. It also applies to the population of cities. A very small number have almost all the people, the mass of heavenly bodies. A very small number hoard all the matter and the frequency of words in a language. 90% of the communication occurs using just 500 words, among other things. Sometimes it is known as the Matthews Principle uh, from the Bible, Matthew 25, 29, derived from what might be the harshest statement ever attributed to Christ. To those who have everything, more will be given. From those who have nothing, everything will be taken. You truly know you are the son of God when your dicta applies even to crustaceans. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, that one caught me off guard right there. <laughs> right? I want to look up this Price's Law thing and see if I can pull up an image from Wiki. I'm wondering because I can get, uh, oh, well, I was reading Sam's comment on civility, access to water. So water and door, plumbing and electricity, we're doing okay. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, like that kind of um I think when I was talking about, you know, civilized society kind of more relating to like crime, I suppose like if we were uh, had a civilized society, there'd be what no crime. Does that make any sense to, to word it that way? Um yeah, it, but what happens I think is that um crimes become um like am i am i mixing two different issues like if we uh, lived in a civilized society we wouldn't need police like a statement like that like that's how i, I interpret like living in a civilized society um yeah it means that you don't have to be as armed because you you don't have to worry about their your neighbors. Um, so yeah, different num raised the 80-20 ratio of Price's Law. Um, and yeah, Samantha P pointed out those classical artists wrote thousands of compositions, so overall their successes are small by comparison. Exactly. And it and it all lines up to this graph, uh, the 80-20 um sort of distribution. And then Different Gnome says, I got a funny fact about Mozart. He wrote a song called Lick Me. <laughs> Lick Me in the ASS. It was a song he and his friends sang in a bar. I think I know about that. But because of his status, uh, you can't find a choir to sing it today. 
And then Samantha P noticed that crime is lower than it's ever been. And it has. Yeah. Yeah. And you know why that is here in New York, it's crazier than it's ever been. Well, that's only because of the lockdowns and everything that de Blasio has been doing and stuff like that. that that's unnatural. But before this whole COVID thing hit, crime was at its lowest numbers ever. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely was. You know why? Uh, defund the police, of course. Right. <laughs> cell yeah. phones. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a cell phone. So you can take a video, you can take a recording, you've got evidence right there. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a higher risk of attacking somebody and they can call 911 immediately. That's why murder rates have dropped, but shootings haven't, you know? Um, yeah, Samantha P says that crime will never disappear because some people's brains are just off. That's very true. That is a good point. Uh, there will always be awful people, unfortunately. Yes. So I agree with that. And then, yeah, she also says Corona is a different story. So, yeah, we've really been driven crazy by these lockdowns. I mean, I remember how hard it was transitioning from being extremely social and extroverted to extremely introverted and, you know, a homebody. Um, cause I used, I used, <laughs> I used to go out every night of the week. I would have a different friend scheduled for dinner every night of the week. And, um, then I'd go out on the weekends with groups and stuff like that. So, I mean, I was extremely sociable and then it became impossible for me to go out and be in those environments. And that transition was just brutal. So I knew that, you know, being in lockdown was going to drive a lot of people very crazy. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It, it set off a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. I, mean, oh. that, uh, I mean, the virus definitely uh, made or breaks a lot of relationships. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it both made my mom's and I relationships stronger and pointed out the extreme weaknesses that we had, you know, so we came into some harsh conflict, um, but then also were able to spend three months together that we otherwise would never have done. So. True. Very true. That's um, that's one thing that can be obviously looked at. Uh, yeah. With the uh, su uh, suicide rate increasing. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. And amongst people that you normally wouldn't think as suicidal, yeah. but they were put under such extreme stress and had no coping skills for it that, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. Could, definitely, uh, I could see why. I mean, yeah. if you're, especially like small business owners. Oh, God. Oh, that's the worst. I mean, that's the thing that the, the lobster's brain melts. Human yeah. brains go through much the same transformation. Our minds melt. Wait, so did uh, did Peterson mean that literally, like that their <laughs> minds dissolve? Yes, that is literal. Oh. Yeah, wow. I thought that was more of like a, a metaphorical kind of, you know, they, they get so demoralized after, you know, losing the fight. Yeah, no, they're, they're, their minds literally oh. melt, they, right, turn to mush and then rebuild themselves cell by cell into an entirely new personality. So, wait, so their cell, I thought, I thought, you know, speaking of cells, like once a cell dies, that's it. There's no coming back, but you're saying. Actually. Can come back. Yeah, they can come back. Um, and that whole idea of once a cell dies, that's it. You know, as far as like brain cells, that's not true. You know, they used to think that the brain was static right. and th that was an old idea coming from like the 1900s, which we have since learned is completely wrong. You can strengthen up areas of the brain by repeating things like um, oh, London yeah. City cavities have a much larger portion of their brain for uh, mapping and, and territories and things like that than anybody else because driving on the streets of London with 
you know, the one way streets and all sorts of weird stuff that goes on in that city. It's one of the hardest cities to be a caddy in. So their brains have a actually restructured themselves to be able to handle that environment. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, I yeah. Follow that. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's why, um, you know, some, some types of psychotherapy can actually work if you are rebuilding areas of your brain, you know, through practice, repetition, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's uh, kind of, like, I used to play piano, and mm -hmm. it's, it's funny, my pops actually asked me the other day, he's like, oh, you still think you could play? I'm like, well, I probably would just have to practice a little bit and yep. you know, get back into the flow, but yeah, it's like like the uh, riding a bike kind of explanation. Yeah, and um, there was a guy, um, he's a science YouTuber, and he actually built a bike where it's backwards, where if you turn the handlebars to the left, the bike turns to the right and vice versa. Huh. And he, he found out that his kids were able to learn how to ride that new bike much faster than he was. Because it, it, he had built it up into his brain so much that it worked this way. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was much more, um, what do you call it, momentum to overcome to learn it the other way. And then switching okay. back to normal, he also had more trouble than his kids. So, surprising. Like, so going back to normal even had some trouble. Yep. Yep. Very surprising. I, yep. Didn't, I didn't expect that at all. Yeah, yeah. So it's I think his YouTube channel is Smarter Every Day. So he's really cool. Um, yeah, we'll go ahead and subscribe. That's a, that's a neat little experiment. Yeah. So Different Gnome says, imagine being so influential that your small throwaway creations are held up as great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then... Uh, different gnome says I never went out for bars or social stuff like dancing and being locked down make me want to go out. Yeah, that was that was a weird reaction that I had. It's like I normally stay home, but now that I can't go out, I want to go out. <laughs> yeah, do the things I took for granted. Um, yeah, it's like, and it's also it's like the governor and these people trying to play parent. They're like, no, mm -hmm. I want to go out now. Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's that's that, that I think is the big, biggest casualty is the children. Uh, Taylor says the children have also been silent suffering mentally from all the lockdowns. Yeah, that's that's the, the thing that's yeah. scariest is the, the number of teenage suicides. Oh, for sure. That's also been scary. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of much younger kids, too, you know, 10, 11, 12, that sort of age group. It's like, oh, my gosh. Yeah, like I'm sure most of them kind of, you know, at the beginning were all happy about schools getting closed and stuff. Oh, yeah. Partying their faces off. But now, yeah, it's what, how long are we actually into this lockdown? It's over a year now, right? No, the lockdown yeah, started in, uh, end of February, beginning of, of March. March, right? Yeah. So, March. right. So, yeah, yeah. Three months. Yeah. Yeah. So different num the big you're grounded. That's <laughs> <laughs> what it feels like. Definitely. Oh, right. And um in ten minutes, I guess, uh, cause uh Bear invited me over to uh go live. I did say I was gonna go live with him later. Yeah, not a problem, not a problem. Um what's his um, name? Uh, they're doing the uh, nacho challenge, right? The yeah, Chico Taco is about to eat like a Carolina Reaper chip. I've, I've seen videos of that online. It is mouth murder. Yeah, yeah I'm going to – I can't wait because he says he's going to be able to handle it, so I guess we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I can't handle spices like that at all. Forget about it. I mean, no. I do jalapeno. Even a I, little bit of habanero I think I can I, – I have tried before. Yeah. Oh, wow. I my <laughs> my ex-husband liked to cook with habanero. I had to leave the house. Oh, really? 
Yeah, it would make my skin burn. It would make my eyes burn. You know, breathing it in, my lungs would burn. I had to leave the house when he cooked with habaneros. Oh yeah, that stuff cleans the sinuses really good. If you ever oh, need it. it's brutal. It is brutal. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's like purposely eating wasabi just to clean out your sinuses. No, wasabi, I can handle. I can handle any amount of horseradish or wasabi, no problem. I love that stuff. Wow. But, okay. Yeah, it's a heat that goes up instead of down. Yeah. If that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, it does make sense. Yeah. It, after, yeah. It does so, make sense. That's fun. Oh, that's hilarious. Uh, different gnome says, "I heard a rumor that the Carolina Reaper lost its pedestal as the hottest pepper. I think I it already it. has, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but I know that uh, what, there's a challenge called the Death Nut Challenge, where what? they use the Death Nut, and it's increasing. It's a peanut, and it's increasing levels of heat until you get up to like several several million Scoville. Oh. Yeah. Yeah." So that's a, that's a, skip that one. Yeah, yeah. It, um, the Tri Channel, which is a bunch of uh, Irish people, did that challenge. Absolutely hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. So, but I want to read a little bit before you have to go. Um, so we got through. Yeah. Definitely enjoying this. Uh, how many? Um, are you going to do more episodes, or um, are you going to do like a once a week book club thing, or? Yeah, it's going to be once a week on Friday, um, and we're going to go through the whole book, um, and then uh, probably by the time we'll done, we'll be done. The his next book will be out, so we can do that. Oh, and, didn't he make a number two though? I think he did another. Um, yeah, it's coming out soon. So, oh, okay, so he's not even done with that yet. I thought he right. came out with the second, uh, like twelve rules for life. Yep, yep. So I've already got it on uh, audio, or well, I purchased the audio version, but I think it comes out uh, later this month or March or something. I don't know. What, so, do, you, what do you use for the audio versions? Uh, like, audible. Audible, yeah, okay. I'm, yeah. I gotta look into that. Yeah. So Anna says, uh, Oh my gosh, I started reading this book and I'm not finished yet. My mom also pre ordered his book for me. Uh, in March, yeah. So it is the second book is coming up on March. Nice. So, cool. Definitely. Yeah. And Taylor says I'm going to order the book so I can follow along each Friday. Awesome. That'll be awesome. Yeah. So yeah. And Anna says hi. Hi Anna. <laughs> so, back to the fractious shellfish. It doesn't take long before lobsters testing each other out learn who can be messed with and who should be given a wide berth. And once they've learned, the resultant hierarchy is exceedingly stable. All a victor needs to do once he has won is wiggle his antenna in a threatening manner, and the previous opponent will vanish in a puff of sand before him. A weaker lobster will quit trying, accept his lowly status, keep his legs attached to his body. The top lobster, by contrast, occupying the best shelter, getting some good rest, Finishing a good meal, parades his dominance around his territory, rousing subordinate lobsters from their shelters at night just to remind them who's their daddy. Oh, man. Yeah. So that's the boys. Now we're going on to the girls. Uh, the female lobster. Oh, I don't want to miss. I'm so. I'm going to keep my schedules free on Friday from now. <laughs> right on. Catch it on the replay. You won't have to catch up with much. I definitely will. <laughs> okay. Uh, the female lobsters who also fight hard for territory during the uh, explicitly, explicitly maternal stages of their existence identify the top guys quickly and become irresistibly attracted to him. This is a brilliant strategy in my estimation. It's also one used by females of many different species, including humans. Instead of undertaking the computationally difficult task of identifying the best man, the females outsource the problem to the machine-like calculations of the dominance hierarchy. They let the males fight it out and peel their paramours from the top. This is very much what happens with the stock market pricing where the value of any particular enterprise is determined through the competition of all. When the females are ready to shed their shells and soften up a bit, 
they become interested in mating. They start hanging around the dominant lobster's pad, spraying their attractive scents and aphrodisiacs towards him, trying to seduce him. His aggression has made him successful, so he's likely to react in a dominant, irritable manner. Furthermore, he's large, healthy, and powerful. It's no easy task to switch his attention from fighting to mating. If properly charmed, however, he will change his behavior towards the female. This is the lobster equivalent of Fifty Shades of Grey, the <laughs> fastest selling paperback of all time, and essentially the eternal Beauty and the Beast plot of archetypal romance. This is the pattern of behavior continuously represented in the sexually explicit literary fantasies that are so popular among women as provocative images of naked women are among men. Yeah, that's very true. Women read porn, men watch porn. Oh. And it's it's that whole, the I mean, Twilight is based on the same thing. Here you have this deadly vampire creature and you transform him into some, something that doesn't want to eat you, you know, and it's based off the way that her blood smells and everything. I mean, it's very, very, you know, just primordial, as it were. Yeah, that sounds like the, definitely the correct word for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it should be pointed out, however, that sheer physical power is an unstable basis on which to found lasting dominance, as the Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal has taken pains to demonstrate. Among the trip, chimp troops he studied, males who were successful in the longer term had to buttress their physical prowess with more sophisticated attributes. Even the most brutal chimp despot can be taken off, down, after all, by two opponents, each three quarters as mean. In consequence, males who stay on the top longer are those who form reciprocal coalitions with their lower status compatriots who can pay careful attention to the troops' females and their infants. The political ploy of baby kissing is literally millions of years old, but lobsters are still comparatively primitive, so the bare plot elements of Beauty and the Beast suffice for them. Once the beast has been successfully charmed, the successful female lobster will disrobe, shedding her shell, literally, making herself dangerously soft, vulnerable, and ready to mate. At the right moment, the male, now converted into a careful lover, deposits a packet of sperm into the appropriate receptacle. Afterwards, the female hangs around and hardens up for a couple of weeks, another phenomenon not entirely known among human beings. Yeah. Have you ever been around a pregnant woman? They become fierce. I mean, like they 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 do not put up with any BS whatsoever. So uh, I, yeah. I don't have any experience in that, and I'm kind of feeling like. <laughs> well, it's fascinating to watch because you'll see this woman who used to be, you know, um, subservient and sweet and everything like that, and she she turns into a mama bear. You know, she's, she's going to protect her nest. Things have to be done this way, you know, or she's going to get fierce. And it's it's fascinating to watch. I bet. Yeah, so. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, it's 830. Yeah, you got to go. You got to go. Well, thank you for coming up. I really appreciate it. Definitely. Thank you for having me. It's definitely fun. I can't wait for more of these episodes. I, I love Jordan Peterson's book so much. So yep. this is definitely going to be, um, this is a treat. I definitely yeah. love it. Yeah. Glad you like it. All right. See you next time. See you. Thank you. Bye. All right. So uh, let's finish this up and then we'll just go to a regular discussion. So, um, and if anybody wants to volunteer, uh, Oh, I think he missed it. Sorry, Shaman. <laughs> so, um, the uh, I'll finish this up, and then we'll, we'll go to a regular chat. And then if next week, if anybody wants to um, come up and watch the chat for me while I have my eyes in the book, that will be helpful. So, um, at this point, another female will attempt the same thing and so on. The dominant male with his upright and confident posture not only gets the prime real estate and the easiest access to the best hunting grounds, he also gets the girls. 
It is exponentially more worth, worthwhile to be successful if you are a lobster and male. Why is all this relevant? For an amazing number of reasons, apart from those that are comically obvious. First, we know that lobsters have been around in one form or another for more than 350 million years. This is a very long time. 65 million years ago, there were still dinosaurs. So this is that is the unimaginably distant past to us. To the lobsters, however, the dinosaurs were the nouveau riche who appeared and disappeared in the flow of near eternal time. This means that dominance hierarchies have been essentially a permanent feature of the environment to which all complex life has adapted. A third of a billion years ago, brains and nervous systems were comparatively simple. Nonetheless, they had already the structure and the neurochemistry necessary to process information about status in society. The importance of this fact can hardly be overstated. Oh, oh Anna, yes, Anna says, me too. I hope to finish the book along with you. Yes, yes. So we've gotten to, in the hard copy, page 11, if you want to follow along. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be getting into this book. And uh, how many pages do we have to go? Oh, goodness. This might take a while. <laughs> so, although it looks like it has a afterwards section. Toughen up, you weasel. Some of these chapters are just amazingly titled. So, okay. So, yeah, we're getting the rule 12. Ah, here we go. So, it's a total of 370 pages. So, that'll only take us, what? If we do it by weeks, we'll be done in a couple of years. <laughs> May take a while um so let me know um you might want to pick up your own copy we might read it i don't know um 34 nights yeah so not an entire year that's good thank you i'm an english major you do the math so thank you different gnome um uh, at 11 pages a session yeah okay so Oh man, that was that, that was good, but I am tired. Uh, but yeah, so 34 nights, they're 52 weeks in a year, so it'll take less than a year to get through the book entirely, and and that's including you know stopping to um, discuss interesting things like uh, this Prado's distribution. So. Um, Samantha P says maybe we, we are, need to get through longer chunks. Yeah, so that's that's one of the things that I wanted to discuss with you guys is do we want to read this on our own and come back and do a discussion about it? Um, you know, maybe find parts that you want to highlight and pull out, and then I can read those bits aloud. Um, but I kind of like reading it to you all and then actually discussing it. Um, I think the more practice that I get in reading aloud, uh, the better we'll get through it. Um, but I actually, I wanted to go for two hours tonight, but I kind of want to shut this down right now because I'm still recovering from my illness and things like that. And I, I, I don't want to uh, wear myself out and I still have to do a live for tomorrow because we want to get into uh, Jordan Peterson's biblical series. Um, so Lawrence says, I love hearing you read it. Oh, good. Well, I actually love reading it. I used to do um, prose uh, competitions in high school. So I, I wouldn't mind reading it. So um, Different Gnome says, we might need 37 pages a session to make it before book two is out. Yeah, I think we could get through, um, if I could hold out longer, than I did tonight. I think we could get maybe like 15 pages, maybe 20 pages. So Taylor says, I'm retaining everything by listening to you. I learned better that way. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people do. Um, and also being able to bring up, you know, things that he talks about in the book, um, like Price's Law and things like that, I think uh, is very useful. Um, Lawrence says, 
when I read, my mind wanders, but when I hear someone else, I can focus better and see what you read in my mind. Okay. Okay. Then I will, I will continue to read it to you guys. Um, yeah. Anna says, whichever works, uh, more than happy to tag along either way. Um, Lawrence says, this is great. I never knew lobsters could be so interesting. Right. Right. Yeah. You thought it was just a, you know, fancy smancy dinner, but no. Uh, Shaman said, this is all good way to dissolve and distill information too. Right. So yeah. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll continue to read it, cut it short tonight because I need to rest. I'm not yet recovered. Um, and um, we will uh, continue through the book uh, next week, uh, same time. Hopefully I'll be able to go for a full two hours then. And um yeah, do little interruptions so we can look things up and, you know, confirm like the logic that lobsters brains literally dissolve, which is absolutely fascinating thing. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, we'll continue to do it that way. So um, does anybody have any final comments or anything like that? You know, I'm, I'm loving this. Um, Different Gnome says, for me, when I read, I get a good thought or topic from the book, and I put it down and pace around the room thinking about the topic. Then I realize I'm hungry and <laughs> get food, right? <laughs> so, yeah, um, let's uh, let's continue in this format. Uh, and if anybody wants to, to come up uh, next week uh, and do chat and, you know, interrupt and, you know, watch the chat and stuff like that, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, definitely getting a little bit of a headache right here. Uh, right, right, right there above the eyebrow. Yeah. Yeah. I have two migraine numbs that live in my head. Uh, and they don't realize that they're in inside my head. So I can't blame them for what they do. But one of them has a pickaxe. And it's just pounding into my head. Uh, and the other one has one of those old fashioned drills that you put your shoulder into and crank one of those giant, you know, for drilling out boring holes for dynamite. And that's the one that's working right above my eyebrow right now. So uh, Shaman says it's a great hive mind around the concepts. Yes. Yes. That's what I really, really like is that everybody's got their input. Everybody's got, you know, little bits of knowledge like Samantha bringing up uh, opiates and serotonin, which I didn't realize before. Um, and it, we don't seem to know all of it right now, but very cool. Um, so, yeah, let's continue to do it this way. Let's continue next week. Um, same time. And um, then tomorrow night, same time, two hours instead of one, since I'm only doing it twice a week now. Uh, we'll do uh, Jordan Peterson's biblical series. We'll we'll start with those, um, and uh, I'll also also watch on my iPad because the chat is quicker on the iPad than it comes up on my um, Streamyard on my computer. And uh, if you want at any point for me to pause, you know, just do a raised hand uh, in the uh, chat, and I'll pause it and let you get a comment out or just spit out the comment and I'll, I'll pause it and we'll talk about it. So, um, yeah, no, just write the, my thinking is going, I should get off, but yeah, I'll see you guys all tomorrow, same time. And, uh, we'll do the, uh, uh, yeah, I do remember that you are a different type of gnome, different gnome. So, uh, cool. Uh, as, as my, my brain starts to melt through lack of serotonin, <laughs> I'm going to go rest now and I will see you guys tomorrow night. Ciao.